Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the third online Tucson Beach Symposium. My name is Flor Caspers, and I am here with my better half, Peter. He is, he's, 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 he's right there. He'll be, um, he'll be behind uh, the scenes. Um, um, for those of you who don't know me, um, as I said, uh, my name is Flor. It is an actual Dutch name. And no, you cannot walk all over me. There's so many jokes that my name brings. I might come up with a few more during this symposium. Um, what we're going to be doing today is listening to three amazing presentations on um, bead history, um, bead making, what beads can do for people, uh, how people can be inspired by beads to give greater meaning um, to something that starts as something physical, um, but can have a greater meaning for people's um, spirit, for people's culture, and for their way of expressing. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And let me first um, quickly uh, introduce the different um, presenters to you. So I'm going to ask um, one by one um, to, uh, well, all of you together, all the different um, presenters that we have. So Robert, Sam and Cindy, if you could um, quickly turn on your cameras. And um, that means you get to see uh, all of us. Hi, Robert, glad that you made it live with us as well. Um, it felt odd to shush you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when you just came into uh, when we were still getting ready, but it's glad that you're here. Um, so these are our presenters. Um, if you want, you can. Um, uh, now we've all seen your faces. You can uh, um, go back to that, and I will uh, go to uh, this one again. It's always there. We go. Um, there we go. Oh, she turned it off. Okay. And then turn off the mic. And here we are again. Um, so that's me again. I'm going to be sharing with you what we are doing for, um, I think it, we're going to be about the next 90 minutes. So let me take you through that. As I said, um, I am uh, Flo Caspers, and I've been doing something with beads for 15 years, I'd like to think, maybe longer, looking at Peter now. Um, I, I beads. Beads. I, sh I should have prepared this, shouldn't I? Um, but I am both a, um, I started as a bead collector, then I started writing about beads. I started um, working with beads. I started working with glass, making my own glass beads and doing bead work. So I do a little bit of everything. And for me, this symposium is a way to bring all of that together um, to have fun with it. So some people have asked me, why is it called the Tucson Beat Symposium? Because we're not in Tucson, um, but it did start out that way. The Tucson Beat Symposium was actually started by Ornament Magazine um, by um, Robert Liu, uh, who you quickly saw and who you'll be hearing more from. Uh, today. Uh, it started as a way for bead collectors and bead researchers to come together to share knowledge. And a good way to do that is to do that in Tucson in, um, uh, in early February, when bead shows, um, gem shows, jewelry shows, uh, all um, uh, everybody in the whole jewelry and gem world comes together in Tucson to share their knowledge. So we had few bead symposiums physically in Tucson. Uh, collaborating with the ethnographic group, um, local bead collectors, um, and collaborating with the Sonoran Glass School. So um, it was three years ago um, that we had the last um, physical Tucson Bead Symposium. And after that, um, due to COVID, we went online. We may do it again in physical form next year, um, but for now, it's been wonderful to see, and I, I can see it all scrolling through um, scrolling through uh, the chat, or I can see uh, from how many countries we're coming today. So one of the downsides is that we don't get to see each other physically, um, but one of the great things is that a lot more people can join us to share uh, the knowledge of beads and the inspiration that beads bring together, even though um, we're not in the same place. 
so what are we going to be doing sharing today these are the presentations that we have lined up for you we'll be um, starting with Cindy then we have Robert and then we have Sam and um, we'll go into more detail of course uh, in those presentations afterwards we are going to be going um, to some of your beads we've invited you because the theme for this year is symbolism in beads we've invited you to share some of the beads that have special meaning to you that are important to you and i'll be um, sharing those with you and the stories that people have um, shared with me to share with you so a few practical reminders um, you can use the chat as you've all been doing um, as you may or may not have noticed, there's a little drop box in there, which when you type your message that says you can either send it to host and panelist, which oddly enough is the default. I've not been able to undo that um, for at least for most people. Um, and you can click on everyone. And that's the one you want. The chat is um, chat amongst yourselves. Uh, um, have fun, um, introduce yourself. Uh, if if the presentations get boring, which I can't imagine because I've seen them, um, uh, that's what you do there. But please don't be sharing any commercial links in the chat because that's not, not what we're here to do. If you have any questions for the presenters, you can put those in the Q&A. So there's a Q&A button as well where um, you can put your questions and uh, we will put those to the presenters. Um, after their presentation. We will be making a recording from this uh, event and we're putting that online. Uh, and also, uh, as I've al already mentioned in the email that you got, we'll, after this, because I can't see you, um, you can see me, I can't see you, um, you also can talk, um, I can talk, um, as you notice. <laughs> so um, it'd be fun to have more of a chat with each other afterwards. So we'll have an informal meetup and we'll be sending you that link. Um, furthermore, uh, in previous years, when we did the online symposium, we've asked people for, um, in a tip jar, for some donations to cover the costs of the symposium. Um, because we're doing it online again, um, last year's donations covered the costs that we need for this year. So we thought we would ask you for donations for the charity of Beads of Courage. In the final presentation of today, um, Sam will be sharing with us uh, a lot more information on Beads of Courage. Uh, I think some of you will already know it, but know that they um, take the meaning of beads very seriously and use it to help uh, children and young people with serious illnesses. So it's like, take the bead and make it matter. Um, so any donations there will be appreciated. That's a lot. Um, if I run out of voice, um, I have COVID. <laughs> I got COVID a few days ago. I am in Peter's house. We not live in the same place. So I'm not surrounded by all my beautiful beads. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I'm surrounded by beautiful books and photography. Um, but if you see me mute myself, or take a sip of drink, it's because, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling COVID in my throat and um, I don't have a fever anymore. I am getting better. Anyway. <laughs> See, there we go. That's when I should mute myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. There was too much talking in, uh, in one go. <laughs> I am going to stop sharing and give the floor. <laughs> See, it was Cindy who was saying, oh, you're fine, Cindy. Cindy said, you don't appear sick at all. Yeah, until I start talking. <laughs> so that means I'm going to give the floor to Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Hi, floor. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry. I, I, just I, I think talk. I might have... <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's just all these beads. It gets me so emotional. <laughs> oh gosh. Anyway, it's, it's so a good funny. it's a good time to introduce you. And we're very glad that Cindy um could make it here. I've met Cindy several times in Tucson. She knows everything about gems. That's what she started in gems and jewelry appraising, um, which she's been doing over 38 years. But she has also taken that knowledge and used it into 
um, sharing that when it comes and and um, using it into teaching other people about beads, about jewelry, and she'll also be telling you about the fascinating books that you've written about this. I'm going to take a sip of water, and I am going to um, ask you, Sydney, to take it away. Okay, I'll take it away. I first want to thank Flor and Peter for moderating this wonderful forum and to tell you that I was present at every in-person Tucson in-person symposium from the beginning. So it is just an invaluable and wonderful thing that Flor and Peter have allowed us to continue virtually. So thank you so much to them and thank them for inviting me. Uh, I also run a school of gemology. I teach diamonds and diamond grading, colored stone gem ident, and I did a course in beads, uh, beadology, the history of human adornment since caveman. Um, when I was with the Glendale Bead Museum, which no longer exists, but that's a little bit more of my background. So this is my favorite topic of all, which I think is why Floor asked me to do this. But I wanted to just say that I also consider myself a jewelry historian since caveman. And I do that offhandedly, but it is kind of true. I love this chart because basically archaeologists and anthropologists consider the bead to be one of the first material objects that was found that had nothing to do with survival. So what was it for? It suggested some sort of complex thinking or symbolic thought. And when that happened, they called us modern man. Now you'll notice this was 2006 in Scientific American. And the reason why I like this is because here's your beats back then around 78,000 years ago. And this is where they are now about 130 to 150,000 years ago. Everything under beads are things necessary for survival. And the line above it that says images is rock art. So that is rather significant when you realize how long before other forms um, beads did in fact exist. So in truth, it was in caveman times. So this is again, uh, shell beads have come back. Um, I'll show you that I had to add this because this is a newer batch of um, purposefully drilled little dove snail shell beads. Uh, interesting that, you know, the sources of these beads they have found to be at quite a distance from where the people habitated. So they were very purposeful in many different ways. And um, these now have been dated almost to 150,000 years ago. This was what was the oldest jewelry, i.e. beads. So I use those terms synonymously because beads are the first jewelry in my mind. Uh, even pendants are considered to be a subcategory of the bead in that they are suspended from the body. This was eagle talons that were found in Croatia dating to about 130,000 years ago uh, they're notched, suggesting that they were held together with uh, either animal, sinew, or plant material. And that was our wonderful friend Neanderthal. So yes, modern man, I give him that. So what is a symbol anyway? I love this first quote that it is something that through its nature or appearance represents something much more profound than itself. I think that's great. It is the most ancient and fundamental method of expression. Um, there's an entire science of this called semiotics or semiotic, uh, which is the study of meaning making. And it is challenging because every different culture can have a different meaning attributed to the same symbol. So one symbol can mean many different things. And so they are culturally affected and that's a bit of a challenge. We all know that symbols take on various functions and often 
um, a single symbol at one time has several different functions or meanings. Jewelry, again, is wearable symbols. How cool is that? And honestly, it is suggested that the very first use of beads had something to do very probably with the function of charms or spiritual beliefs. Charms being something that early humans or humans to this day feel has some effect in nature around them. And subcategories of charms, amulets, which are keeping bad away, and talisman, which are bringing intended desires to you. The other things we are familiar with, and again, a single necklace or bead can um, apply to several of these different functions at the same time. So there's two theories that have been put out there as to you know how did symbols, how did this subconscious thing emerge from our subconscious and become a physical expression? We're going to go through those two now. The first being something called ent optic theory. And you can see it's pretty old, put out by Lewis Williams and Dawson in 1988. Ent means within optic system. So we're talking about the retina, the optic nerve, and going into the visual cortex in the back of our brain. The thought here is that when we have some sort of pressure, like you're rubbing your eyes, which we all do, uh, that motion is going to produce these six or any of these different six patterns, the grid, parallel lines, dots, zigzags, meandering lines, and open U-shaped things. So this is going to be our homework tonight or later today or whenever you rub your eyes, really think about, am I seeing any of these or how many or et cetera? So supposedly with this theory, these images are already built into our cellular nature. Very interesting theory. Here we're seeing some of these, which is so cool in you know old uh, Neolithic time, um, North and uh, Newgrange in Ireland, you've got your undulating lines, you've got a spiral, which we're going to be talking about that. Over here, there's undulating, there's C shapes. Um, again, spirals. This one is showing opposed spirals. Again, we'll talk about the spiral here, uh, but that is creating the balance. Down here, we've got the zigzags, which when they meet up, give us this diamond shape. And on the far right, not only do we have horizontal uh, lines, but we have those open C shapes. My world has changed. My worldview, <clears throat> excuse me, sees things so differently now that I have made a study of symbolism. These were tiles on a floor in a restaurant and I just was sat there dumbfounded. Um, there are our entoptic uh, zigzags, parallel lines, the dots, this, the vertical line, the uh, triangle and the square we're gonna be talking about, but you see these horizontal lines going and vertical lines, the direction of lines can have very different meanings. So this was just so cool to see. I'm not gonna give you enough time to really look at this. Uh, however, we're gonna be talking about them. I did wanna mention that this is in my new book, Symbolism in Global Jewelry. And honestly, there's an error in my opinion, we should have, I'm trying to get my little cursor there. We should have put a semicolon or something in between uh, these things where that was the earliest time those shapes were, were seen in the archeological record. But the date itself is when it actually became much more common. So um, it's hard to kind of figure that out on your own. So let's get into some of these basic symbols, circles being one of the oldest, as is the spiral. Circles are considered to be a special case of the spiral in that two points connect. And in doing so, there is no beginning, there is no end, it becomes now. It is most important of all, a symbol of the heavens or of sky. 
And so we see that in most cultures around the world. A uh, series of rings like this, uh, what looks like a bullseye over here <clears throat> is completeness. It is also a dynamic eye, you know, bulging and, and piercing. So it has that application. And dots are just the circles that, that we saw. They can be open like this one or filled in like the one on the far right. And a circle with dot is um is is the eye symbol actually this could be said the other way a dot in circle and is also a symbol of the uh the Tao. one thing is when a circle becomes three-dimensional it turns into a sphere most people in their minds think of beads as being spherical which we all know they really rarely are very often they are somewhat spherical with the ends being cut off on either side. So um, that is an oblate. And also we have barrel shaped beads and often they're not perfectly round, but that's okay. We, we understand that. Just a good picture of tribals in concentric rings and circles. There's a circle up here at the top. You know, her earrings are circles. And just for floor, because there has to be cat in everything, <laughs> every little thing, here are concentric beads around a pussy cat. And I actually took that picture of the dog on the boardwalk in San Diego, which was amazing. So going a little bit further, that dot in circle. Um, the picture on the top left is an airplane from Turkey, Turkish Air. And that is uh, wonderful that they were representing it there. And we see this an awful lot because it is so ancient. However, um, 6000 BC doesn't sound all that ancient, but just the, the making of concentric circles produces a dot and circle. So it was a symbol before its use as an evil eye symbol which they believe is somewhere around 3000 BC where it was first attributed to that. The earliest eye beads uh, that weren't just sort of accidental were agate eyes and they predate the glass eye beads by about 500 years or so where they were really prevalent in the marketplace, shall we say. And there is an early written reference to an evil eye in the Old Testament, somewhere around 1400 to 1450 BC. I thought you'd enjoy seeing this in situ and then cleaned up. Uh, this was in Siberia. Um, Phoenician made glass beads with the concentric eyes, um, giving sort of that bulging effect, very effective. You like my little spiral thing? So spirals are one of my favorite of all symbols, so old. It is believed to be the rotating energy of the cosmos. Uh, scientists consider them and define them as being expanding, contracting, or staying as in many of our plant forms or fossils. Uh, they would have continued growing had they stayed alive, but the spiral is also one of two basic symbols that has different meanings depending upon its direction. So mathematically, these things, symbols, start from the inside out. So as we trace this, it's going counterclockwise, southern hemisphere, Coriolis effect. Uh, it represents sort of an introversion or a coming into a trance-like state um, and is used for that purpose. This is why the Sufi whirling dervishes spin in a counterclockwise direction versus the one underneath starting from the inside again. We are now going clockwise. It is a Northern hemispherical Coriolis effect. Uh, it is evolution. It is a male symbol. The counterclockwise is a female symbol. And um, it's cool to know that. And I always look at symbols now and decide whether they are clockwise or counterclockwise. Some examples of application on old Venetian trade beads. Um, you know, we recognize those. These are within the marble beads, the getting a spiral. 
We've got in nature, the Papua New Guinea boar's tusk and copies of that in bone and also expressions in the material form of metal. When you've got a spiral and the radius of all the loops is the same, it is called a coil. Coils are used as surface decoration on a lot of our beads, as you see over here on the right, again, old Venetian made. And then, and here's some metallic ones on the bottom right, when the radius tapers and gets smaller and often ends in a single point, uh, it is a coil. I'm sorry, it's a coin and these, a, a cone, <laughs> well, so it's a cone and you see this an awful lot. This has additional symbolism that's sort of uh, expressed from some godhead or a superior power, um, et cetera. Straight lines are very important. Uh, they have been a symbol in nearly all ancient cosmologies. It is the spine around which everything or all energy rotates. It's been given many different names in different parts of the world, but Axis Mundi is one that you sometimes hear. Uh, it is used in the shamanic tradition very much where they often have a staff that they're holding onto. The belief being that by holding this, it enabled them to pass through the different layers of existence and be able to get back safely. There are different meanings for the horizontal line, as well as a vertical line, as well as a diagonal line, where horizontal is earth, it is stable, it is calming, vertical is more power, authoritarian connection to a godhead, and diagonal is very dynamic, move, moving along some path. So, now we're gonna add some additional straight lines and intersect. Uh, we get the cross pattern, we get the X pattern. Um, one of my favorite things is where the two lines or more lines intersect, you know, down here or down here, it is called the nexus. And I love this, this symbolism that they believe it is the place where everything is possible. So down here we have, you know, a six ray star, that's a rose quartz doing its wonderful thing. In the center, this is the backside of an ancient Indonesian bird bead. And um, on the far right is a star sapphire, uh, the result of which is the inclusions in it and it's reflecting off of it. Squares are primarily an earth symbol. They are temporal, um, Whereas the circle, which was the heaven symbol, is infinite. It's amazingly wonderful to see them balanced and expressed in certain beads, uh, like in our Z bead and in jewelry. And down here in this so-called tic-tac-toe Venetian beads, um, you're seeing an antoptic symbol, the grid, but the grid forms squares. And within those squares, they put circles. And in many of those circles, they filled it in with I. And this bead is also a red color and red is an earth symbol. So look how much deeper we are penetrating into the depth of a bead just by looking at them and knowing about the symbols that they either have surface decorated or treated or done naturally. Triangles are the second, the other symbol that has directionality. When it faces upward, it is considered to be a male symbol. When it faces downward, it's a female symbol. And when you combine the two or overlap them, you are creating a duality or a balanced homeostasis. Uh, you know, these beads over here are the Kipa bead uh, from Mauritania made by the women. And there are many examples of all of these, just wonderful pictures here. Uh, these beads here, you know, have a bit of a, a triangle pointing upwards where she's wearing jewelry with the triangle face, facing down as well as the hair, whoops, sorry, the hair 
pieces and the Torah gent on the far right is facing upward, which is male. Waves and zigzags, again, both of these are ent optic uh, within our optic system, as well as being basic symbols. I mean, snakes are undulating or meandering. However, their vertebra is very zigzag and it is modeled beautifully by Rihanna, uh, adorned with a bunch of the old Czech molded snake beads. We're also seeing the zigzag patterns on the chevrons or um, Rosetta type stones on ancient Islamic. And we're seeing wavy pattern in the old Venetian so-called tire beads. Just wonderful example of combining different symbols. Uh, we see the zigzag pattern right here. We see triangles, some facing down, some facing up. Why? To keep homo homeostasis, keep the balance. The center is a dome-shaped bead. You saw in the description, these are old surface-treated carnelian beads, 5th to 11th century. Uh, a four-directional cross like that, not only is it a directional thing, but it is an earth symbol as well, and a symbol for the number four, and this has the dots. So the dots are sky or heaven, and this, the um, cross is an earth symbol. Not only that, but what color are these carnelian? They are reddish along with the bluish, red being the color of earth, and blue being the sky or the heavens. Wonderful, wonderful pieces made by Helen Margie in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is where I am today. Uh, just some other examples of uh, the balance being created by using beads. This blue red color balance is used ubiquitous throughout the world. Uh, we see it dominating in Southeast Asia, but also right where I am, you know, in Southwestern America. So often there is an inclusion of yellow or amber or amber imitations, which is uh, representing the sun and creating a warmth there. So just a quick review. I mean, this was challenging uh, knowing that it had to be somewhat short. Uh, I give lectures on this um, an hour and a half all myself because <laughs> there's so much to talk about and it's so interesting. But really the take of all this is that symbolic thought has been linked to us being defined as modern men, modern women, modern humans. And uh, they are a wearable symbol, as is all jewelry. So not only are they a symbol, they express other symbols through their shape, uh, color application, color of the, the bead itself. Um, very, very heavy little objects. Uh, same symbols used in ancient times are still used. And it's rather poignant to realize that if this was one of the first things leading to us being quote unquote modern man, then it, they're still with us, um, which takes us sort of to the bottom one, which it's a tangible bond. It's something we can have that connects us to our past. And so it's a somewhat of a, a time machine in a way. And certainly for me, but I think for everybody, the more you understand symbolism, uh, the more profound the world gets around you and fascinating and you understand cultures a lot more. This is just an image of the two books that I have put out. Uh, the left one is sort of the history of human adornment since caveman through the bead. And the right is the history of design or symbols um, expressed as symbols and then applied into jewelry of all eras from uh, historic to antique to contemporary to ethnic um, everything. Uh, I try to go through re geologic regions and talk specifically about their symbols so that when you see a piece, you will be able to hopefully identify its source. So I just loved this. 
when one gives close attention to anything, it becomes a mysterious and magnificent world in itself. Thank you, Henry Miller. That applies so much to symbolism when you start to really pay attention to what you're looking at. This little critter right here, he's got the endoptic C curves over his eyes and parallel lines going down the body and color symbolism, you, you know, vacillating hot and cold. And um, I am taking this opportunity to remind you that you have to rub your eyes at some point tonight or today and um, start trying to realize or be aware of whether or not you're seeing some of those six end optic symbols. So thank you all very much for having me as a speaker. And we've got so much more fun to pay attention to. So I am going to stop my sharing now. Well, okay. that was that was wonderful. Um, Thank you. And and um, it's not just me um, because of course I'm biased because I invited you. But uh, <laughs> I've been I've been keeping an eye on the chat and people really. Um, so, um, Sharon said, I don't think I'll ever look at beads and jewelry quite the same again. I think you that's know, kind I of your know. intent, wasn't it? <laughs> that was, it is. <laughs> we have quite a few questions from people. Um, I'm going to start with what might be the, um, which I would think might be the trickiest by Lara, who said, um, how do you know what the intention of symbols was in the, um, for example, in the Neolithic area? Um, perhaps they just thought it was pretty. Yes, we of course don't. <laughs> we have no idea. <laughs> um, but but there they are, all the same. And uh, I'm not trying to attribute any meaning to those old symbols. I'm just trying to reflect the date of when they were first seen and uh, capture the fact that they were actually done by some early humans. And as we all know, even at Stonehenge, they keep finding more and more evidence that what they thought Stonehenge was for could have in fact been used for something completely different. So I think it's still up to the scholars to be uh, continuously deciding this and it's the science for all of us to partake. But not to let it keep us from finding symbols and being inspired by symbols. And being thrilled by them. So a question um, that was asked is um, was specifically about amber beads. Um, that there's a lot of amber beads that have been carved into animals and animal shapes. Is there any reason why um, that was specifically done in amber? It's a very specific, we're going all over the place with these questions because your topic was of course so incredibly wide. Does yes, that... and, and I narrowed it so completely completely um, it's 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 so much more broad uh in my very first chapter of the book i try to talk about the basic symbols and then the other symbols the other chapters are colors they are creatures they are uh human construct things like numbers and alphabets so i mean every single thing it is so vast it boggles the mind but back to amber amber was one of the first uh, yellow colors um, believed it was warm to the touch so it sort of symbolized sun or a warming feature it's also very very soft so it's easy to form and it lent itself to early bead to being an early bead so, so maybe uh, it, it's it's also one of the early trade objects so um, everybody coveted it and another question that we had is, and I think um, maybe you've gone into that a little bit already. Um, you you mentioned several symbols that have a female version and a male version. Uh, Only two. And any examples of non-binary symbols? Non-binary. Well, I think all symbols could be. You know, again, this is uh, in a new world. We are doing non-binary. Unfortunately. You know, people who watch Joseph Campbell and and the power of the myth, uh, they talk about male and female and, and when certain things, you know, matriarchal and patriarchal societies are very, very different. And unfortunately, it's been a part of uh, our human path that hopefully we will conquer dividing up the two. 
so we have a um, few more questions, but I don't, I think all of these questions, you know, about, um, about um, German agates, about sea beads, I think there's a risk of when we start answering those, we, we're going to need the whole symposium, which could be a good idea. I'm not, I'm not um, discounting that, but we do have interesting things on them. But I'm going to um, have um, Michelle's question. Um, I'm going to be doing that one. Are you drawn more to any specific symbols? Do you have any favorites that you're more drawn to than others? I'm crazy about spirals. <laughs> I don't know what it is about them. I think it's that they're active, they're dynamic. Um, they take you somewhere and you don't know where. Uh, I, I just love them for that. But I am a huge fan of the combination of symbols. Um, that fascinates me. Just this morning, I took a picture of uh, a painting on the wall behind the breakfast table, which had spirals, straight lines, triangles, a hand, an eye. I mean, I was just, <laughs> oh my God, how do they know that today we're talking about symbolism? <laughs> it's marvelous. That, I love the combo. Is... So Cindy, thank you so much um, for yeah. joining us and for answering these questions. And we'll hope you'll stick around and um, because we're going to a very different type of presentation, which is what I love. So I'm going to ask um, Robert to join us. See if you can find it. Are you still there, Robert? There you go. I'm going to see if we can find Robert for us. Ah, there you are. And I am going to. Now you can find you. Okay. Um, Laura, we're going to have to catch a plane pretty soon. Okay, we don't and, want you missing uh, so your. So why don't you use my video, and I may not be able to answer any questions. No, but I just wanted to say that I'm glad that we are able to keep this tradition going, and I wanted to tell you because remember I said um, that I'm not in my house surrounded by beads, but what I'm wearing here, there's Peter, is a Harold Cooney bead. The first time I met you was at Tucson at the Best Bead Show. And you were standing at Harold Cooney, who is a wonderful glass bead maker. Um, yes. You were standing at his stall and I was looking at his beads, they were beautiful beads, but I recognized your face and I was a little bit shy. You may not want to believe this, but I was a little bit shy, but I was like, I, I do have to meet Robert Lou because he knows so much about beads and I want to be like Robert when I grow up. So this is, I think, about 10 years ago. So I know you have to go, but I wanted to share that story with you. And I'll be sharing your presentation uh, in a bit. So th thank you. Is there uh, anything me... specific you would like to let people know before you have to run? We do have to tell them. Oh, it, it's just that this, to uh, keep it at 15, 16 minutes for a very, very complicated subject in which there are very large questions that are unanswered since I have not been able to hear reply from the author of the biggest study of these means that we really are um, at opposite opinions. And uh, as you will hear in this, my analogy of what I am studying and what she is studying, a native Taiwanese woman who did her PhD. So uh, if I cannot stay for any questions, I want you to know that this is a, a, a very, very puzzling uh, research problem that after 40 years, I'm more confused than ever. <laughs> I think that's a good, I know it's frustrating and I have some of those questions in the bead world myself, but in general, I think that inquisitive nature is, is a good thing to have. And to if, if all the answers were easy to find, what would be the fun of it? <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who um, have not had the pleasure of meeting Robert before, um, Robert is the co-editor together with uh, Patrick Beneshlu, his son, who you can have heard in, in the background. Um, there he is, see, um, they are creating um, 
this wonderful magazine, which is Ornament Magazine, and Peter will be sharing a link to Ornament Magazine, which has been going for 40, 40 years, more than 40 years. 49. Um, 49? Yes. Wait, I thought we just had the 40th anniversary. I'm confused. <laughs> we're, we're not good at math. <laughs> you, I didn't miss that, did it? It was 40 once before. Anyway, we're not good at, we're good at beads. Let's keep it at that. And what I, um, what I love about reading the magazine is not just the, how beautiful it is, but that it shows your, um, your inquisitive nature, your curiosity to always learn more, both about the beauty and about the meaning. So that's what I wanted to say. I'm going to share your presentation and um, either we will see you after or we will see you another time. Yes, sorry, we, we're, we're here for my sister's memorial. So uh, um, that's why everything is sort of a... Yeah, be, you know, beats are important, but they're not that yes. important. Yes. <laughs> Hello, I am speaking today on the rare heirloom beads of the Paiwan and its replica industry. I know that this symposium is about symbology and every one of these beads have deep symbolic meaning to the Paiwanese culture. But I think there is a more important question of what exactly are we studying? I think that the closest analogy is two blind people feeling the front and the rear end of an elephant and thinking that they both know what an elephant is. One of them is me, and I've been studying the Taiwanese as well as other Taiwan aborig Aborigines for since 1983. The other is a Taiwanese PhD student who did her dissertation in 2015 on the Taiwanese culture and with a large emphasis on their beads. Their beads are really beautiful and rare, and we don't really know where all of them are made, even though they are heavy lead, and that suggests Chinese, but I don't know if all of these are really Chinese. Here we see on the left a beautifully strung multi-strand necklace composed largely of monochromes with a center section of polychromes. The middle picture shows in detail some of these polychrome beads and there are the distinctive moli moli tan, the most valuable, as well as the faux chevrons, which the Taiwanese call warrior beads. On the right, we have a, a very well-made replica necklace from 2008 and others from 2000 um, that were given to me from Mary Lee Hu, who lived there, as well as Dirk Ross, who also lived there and also taught the Taiwanese how to make replicas. Here we have three, uh, two, intact necklaces, one with additional forms of personal adornment. And you can note that they're elaborately strung and all with center sections. But unfortunately, sometimes they're too small for me to know what exactly the beads are. There are other forms of Paiwan necklaces because rarely do people own the multi-strand. To the left is a two-strand with the valuable beads at the bottom and monochromes at the top. The center section is a restrung one in the West and it's done very incorrectly because the monochromes are mixed with the polychromes and many of them don't look like they're really the type that are used in Taiwan necklaces. Although you can see that there are a few moli moli tons and uh, uh, so that this is a, a strange one. To the right is a very, very good strand, a collector strand owned by the same woman that owned the left-hand necklace. And you can see these beautiful moli moli tons, the faux chevrons, and other kinds of beads, including 
uh, curved striped beads, uh, melons, and uh, gold glass. The, the puzzling thing is I think that the Paiwan beads studied by Chen may all be replicas. Here we have a unusual seven strand necklace with chain spacers, which other Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Aborigines do use on their jewelry. But the center section all look like they're made of clay, as well as those at the top. When she shows the 17 important beads, these look very, very different than those on Western or Japanese collections. I've tried to contact her by email, but there is no response after three weeks. Here we show the same necklace. We compare it with the center section from the West or Japanese collection, as well as another museum specimen. And you can see that there's a large differences and no congruence. Although here we can see that all chevrons are in both uh, of, of these necklaces to the right. Here are the center sections of three Western or Japanese collections. And you can see they all have uh, similar beads, especially the moli moli tans, as well as the fall chevrons, and also swirl beads, uh, stripe beads that are uh, like these straight or curved. And those necklaces are all eight to 11 strands, which uh, Chen did not show. Here we have a chart made by Uma Zinger, the first uh, Taiwan bead maker to replicate these beads. They each are named and have symbolic meaning as well as gender, but none of these appear to coincide with beads on power necklaces in Western or Japanese collections. So this makes me think that we're dealing with two very different populations, Taiwan made versus foreign made beads. Perhaps due to what has happened post World War II, when uh, they started making uh, replica beads and also selling their original ones to outsiders. Here we have replicas from the 19, early 1990s. These are very well-made replicas of uh, Chinese uh, faux chevrons, very well trailed. The moli moli tan are convincing. They look dirty, they have pits, they are raked or combed. The monochromes are well made, as well as the other ancillary beads, like the striped beads, straight or curved. So these were courtesy of D Dirk Ross, who lived there and also taught the Taiwanese. So what is happening? Have skills dropped so much since the early 1990s, or is it something else? Here we compare UMass to Yunnan beads, which are the closest analogies to comb beads that were found in 2004. This is compared to a Thai bead that is also combed. We look at some 1990s replicas. Uh, Peter Francis has found comb beads from Sarawak and the Philippines, although these are quite different than the ones on air, Taiwan heirloom necklaces. This strand from Indonesia is quite corroded, but the striped beads are similar to those on Taiwan. Um, here is one from Sarawak given to me by Lynn Darmody in the 1980s. Here you see a swirl bead. You see monochrome discs. You see the uh, Chinese faux chevrons. So there are definitely places in 
Southeast Asia, where there are bees that are similar to what uh, occur on Paiwan necklaces. And these are undoubtedly either European or Chinese. Here we show more bees uh, on the left. They're from Borneo, especially Sarawak, the Malaysian part of Borneo. And then uh, here you can see the swirl bead, the, the Chinese, faux chevrons, striped beads. Then these beads from Sumatra, the, the faux chevrons are exactly like those that are found on uh, Taiwan necklaces or collector strands. So we can see that Taiwanese adhere very strongly to their culture. These girls are wearing their costumes, which have some resemblance to Chinese uh, dress, but uh, with a distinct flavor. They wear their beads. But here we can see that this is UMass Zinger replicas. This is from maybe the Schur studio, which follow Moli Moli Tan, but don't look like it because they look too new. Uh, the, the girl on the right may be wearing real replica beads, uh, real heirloom beads, but I can't tell from the image. According to Dirk Ross, the Paiwan do not want outsiders to have their authentic heirloom bees. But the chiefly class, after the Han came, had to sell them to raise money since they no longer controlled the land ownership and could not collect tribute from the commoners. And according to Paiwanese culture, the chiefly class could earn own certain beads. They could buy certain types of replicas, but commoners were restricted as to what they could buy or wear. Here we have a Paiwan bead makers making replicas in well-equipped studios. Um, but note that both of these stations have these bead cards, um, which I will speak about in a moment. The first replicas were made in 1976 by Uma Singer, and there are glass and clay replicas. Here we see again, one of these well-equipped studios that are Presbyterian sponsored, they have ample supplies of glass, which are locally made. Uh, these are all courtesy of Mary Lee Hu, the renowned metalsmith who lived there. Uh, there are at least three major bead workshops. Umas, who has the Paiwan Bead Studio. Sure, who has the Dragonfly Studio. And the Laos, who have the Dancing Bead Studio. Here we have a close-up of the 24 named bead cards in Chinese and English, uh, which the students use to re make replicas. But these really, other than the patterns, they look nothing like the real heirloom Paiwan beads. Um, as I said, in 1976, the first glass replica was made. There are three kinds of replica beads. Those are glass, those are clay-like or jade-like, and I have only seen glass beads, glass replicas. If we look closer at these, a UMass necklace bought in 2008 for $150 by Mary Lee Hu shows very well-made center beads in a traditional necklace, four-strand necklace, uh, using Kona spacers, but these look nothing like real heirloom beads seen in the West. Um, 
supposedly uh, a real heirloom deed then costs three hundred dollars, and a necklace costs seven thousand dollars. Of course, now they're much much more expensive if you can buy one. Here we have Mary Lee Hu's necklace, along with bracelet beads that she got and bracelet beads from Dirk Ross. They're very accurate in following the patterns of Umas, but they look nothing like it because their shape is completely different. They're too shiny. Um, Rio heirloom beads are all cylindrical with ground ends. If we look closer at these, you can see how poorly the Umas beads follow the Rio uh, Chinese faux chevrons. So the skills definitely have dropped since then, but it may just be that the students are respectful of their teacher and follow the bead cards very closely. But again, more magnified images of UMass beads and you can see that these are very, very crude, no raking, no real trailed lines, and no combing. So uh, thank you. Um, the situation is, uh, with regards to the bees, is still very confused. And I hope someday that either floor or Chen can explain why we're looking at such different populations of beads. So thank you very much, Robert, for that fascinating presentation. What I love is how we've gone with Cindy's presentation, which was um, through so many different times and so many different cultures. With your presentation, we really zoomed in on a specific topic. Even though you said it's very broad, for a lot of people, this is very, very specific. Um, so that is fascinating. And I did I did um, uh, try to visit one of the studios, but I, I don't know. I think I was looking at a different end of the elephant again, um, because the studio when I was there was closed um, temporarily for, for renovation. So... <laughs> Yes, uh, well, I, I didn't get to say that I was on the butt end of the elephant, and that's my impression of the elephant, and she was at the front. So, uh, you know, uh, hopefully one of us is right and studies the middle of the elephant or something, and I hope really that you will learn something, but it may be very difficult because this tribe adheres to their culture very tightly, and a foreigner that does not speak Taiwanese or uh, Paiwanese, which is even more difficult, may be really looking at a giraffe. Yep, yep. True. So uh, good luck and uh, thank you all. Do you want to stick off for questions? Oh, are there any questions? At the, at, at the moment, there, there are no questions. I think yours okay. was very specific. Um, so we will, um, um, we will let you go. Okay. We don't want you to miss your plane. Um, right. We're very glad that you were able to join us. Well, thank you and get well from COVID. I will. And love you all. Bye, bye bye. And bye from Patrick. Bye. So, um, on to uh, on to the next. I am going to. There we go. There we are, and then we are back on me. See, now it's all me again. Um, that was wonderful. Um, uh, I enjoyed that, especially as I mentioned, I tried to learn more about these beads from Taiwan myself, um, but it's elusive, uh, um, which I think is good to, uh, um, to keep some of those mysteries, but we should be finding out more before there's, there's nobody else who knows about these beads anymore. So that was two out of three presentations. We have one more presentation to go and then um, I'll be sharing a lot of your beads that you shared uh, with me. 
So uh, without further ado, I am going to introduce Sam Hibler, Sam Hibler, um, who is a bead and glass artist. And uh, let's, uh, let's get you, uh, there you go. Let's get you in full screen. So um, she's a bead artist. She's a glass artist. Um, she's uh, uh, an all around cool person. And uh, also someone who was recently inducted, I think the word is, in, um, uh, in the Hall of Fame from Beads of Courage. And she'll be sharing with us um, her journey and uh, what she creates and what she creates for other people. So um, please go ahead. So everybody knows that my name is Nina Sam Hibbler. And they've probably figured out that everyone calls me Sam. I live in beautiful San Antonio, Texas, where I teach glass classes, make flame work beads, and design jewelry. San Antonio is a happy, fun place to live. Our city is rich in culture and traditions of the many people who have made San Antonio their home. There's not a weekend that doesn't have a festival. Every party has a piñata. Homes are adorned with Colorful paper flowers and papel picados flutter in the wind above the streets. The city is alive with dancers spinning in bright circular skirts as luminarias light the night. Spring in Texas bring wildflowers that adorn every roadside and field with acres of color. My work is influ influenced by the traditions, colors, motion, and joy that surround me. The necklace on top features the Texas wildflowers, and the piece below it is titled Fiesta Dia de los Muertos, which color features colorful bones, skulls, and flowers. I'd like to show you a little bit more of my work um, and the symbolism in it. My beads are symbols of life's experiences changes, metamorphosis, analogy, and narratives of lessons learned. Whether the beads are strung together into jewelry or an individual bead, they have meaning. These leaves, and I would use my cursor, but then my screen changes, so I think you can figure out the leaves, <laughs> are formed in the flame with glass. The purple leaf necklace was created to symbolize the metamorphosis of leaves as they lose their green camouflage and reveal their true colors in the moments before they return to the earth to nourish the trees they adorned. So many people go through life hiding their true beauty, the beauty that lies beneath the facade, afraid to show it out of fear of rejection. The bead in the middle is part of a series I call Touch. The rings and layers of the beads symbolize the experiences and the people who touch our lives. Each event laying down a layer like sediment preserving our story. The surface of the bead is smoothed by cold working the glass through a series of grits that wear away the shiny surface and leave the bead soft to the touch. Just like life wears away at us, the outcome of this wear can be wonderful. We learn from our experiences from each person or event that forms us. What happens to us cannot always be controlled, but who we become is up to ourselves, embracing our new beautiful form. The necklace on the right depicts the four seasons. It represents spring, summer, fall, and winter. In Greek mythology, Persephone was the daughter of Zeus, and I forgot to mention the name of the necklace is Persephone's Lot. Persephone was the daughter of Zeus and Demeter. In the Greek mythology, the story was used to explain the changing of the seasons. Persephone was abducted by Hades and held there in the underworld. Demeter searched the earth for her daughter, and after finding that du Zeus had conspired with Hades, Demeter was furious and refused to let the earth bear fruit until her daughter was returned. Because Persephone had eaten a few pomegranate seeds, which I hope you can see, um, 
are, uh, I'm seeing myself on the right-hand side of the screen, <laughs> um, had eaten a few of pomegranate seeds, she would forever spend part of the year in the underworld. Her annual return to the earth in the spring, the flowers at the top left, was marked by flowering of the meadows, the growth of the summer harvest. Then her return to the underworld triggered the dying down of the plants and the barren winter. The leaves that represent um, winter are both and precious metal clay. And this was a collaboration um, with Lisa Connell. So that's just a little bit about my work and the symbolism that I put into my work. And I'd like to speak now about Beads of Courage. I've been involved, well, first I wanna share that Beads of Courage just celebrated its 20th anniversary. I've been involved with Beads of Courage since for 17 years now. I met the founder, Jean Baruch, in 2006 at the ISGB gathering in Kansas City. She spoke to us about Beads of Courage and I have been a supporter ever since. What is the Beads of Courage program? A lot of what you're seeing on the screen is straight from Beads of Courage because I wanted to represent them um, the best way I could, but also correctly. So um, Beads of Courage is a resilience-based intervention designed to support and strengthen children and teens coping with serious illness and their families. It is a standard of care in more than 300 children's hospitals worldwide. Through the program, children tell their stories using colorful beads that serve as meaningful symbols honoring the courage displayed along their unique treatment path. How does it work? Upon enrollment, each child is given the Beads of Courage bead to color guide, which we're going to see in a minute. They call this Beads of Courage prescription. The child's Beads of Courage experience begins when they are given a length of string and beads that spell out their first name. Then colorful beads, each representing courage during their treatment experiences are given to the child by professional health care providers as determined by the Beads of Courage prescription. As beads are added their beads of, to their Beads of Courage collection, children and teens can record, tell, and own their stories of courage. A little bit about who can participate in the program. And you can see there she's holding um, her beginning beads and all the many beads that she has collected. Children and teens with cancer and blood disorders, cardiac conditions, burn injury recovery, neonatal intensive care, chronic illness, rehabilitation care, trauma recovery, pediatric intensive care, palliative and support care are able to join the program. How does it help the children? Ongoing evaluation of the Beads of Courage program indicates that it helps decrease illness-related distress, increases the use of positive coping strategies, and helps the children find meaning in their illness, restores a sense of the self in child children coping with the serious illness, and the program also provides something tangible the beads that they can use to tell their story of courage displayed during treatment and after. Why beads? Well, to all of us here, why not beads? Beads are wonderful. <laughs> when Jean was developing the program in Arizona, she was looking for something tangible and lasting to reward the children receiving treatment for their bravery. At the time, the rewards were stickers. Those were easily lost or destroyed. She had visited the Arizona Bead Museum and that's when she knew that beads were perfect. And these are all the reasons that we know beads are perfect. They signify strength and courage. They have everyday uses. 
They have served many practical purposes throughout history. Beads carry value. Beads have been traded for everything. Societies across the world have made beads from tortoise shells, wood, pottery, seashells, all that we've seen in some of the presentations, and glass. Some of the world's most talented glass bead artists or glass artists devote their whole careers to making beads. In many societies, beads are believed to carry protective and healing powers. Beads signify status. And given the length of time, which I think that timeline has been blown away by an earlier speaker, <laughs> um, people have been fascinated with beads as well as their, their usefulness for counting, adorning, and symbolizing importance. They're just the right for recognizing and recording the children's courage as they travel this journey. This picture is very special to me. I've never met Hawkins, but he is a constant companion when I'm making beads. His picture sits behind my torch station, reminding me that these tiny orbs of glass mean so much. I'd like to share with you some of the children and parents' words on what the beads mean to them. I'm quoting a mother, Judy. And I promised I wouldn't cry, but guys, I'm tearing up. <laughs> Beads of courage is a light in a dark journey. Beads create such a colorful, warm, and calming chain. They keep track of the moments when courage had to shine to power through the pain and fear. Quoting another mother, Lindsay, when I look at Reed's beads, I quickly see a year of trials and triumphs a year when life tried to break us, but didn't. Looking at his beads of courage reminds me just how much my son is a warrior. He went to battle for his life and survived. It's been six months since he received his life-saving heart transplant. And when I look at his beads, it gives me hope for his future. Each bead serves as a reminder that Reed will be able to get through whatever may come. And last, one of the children puts it very simply, Clara. When I found beads of courage, it made my medical journey feel like it had purpose. I don't feel so alone anymore. So here's a little bit about the beads because I know a lot of people do are not familiar with the program and they're interested what kind of beads do they use? So program beads are commercially made beads because they are used in such large quantities. As you can see from the chart, each bead has a color and a specific meaning. So when you see those large strands of beads that the children are wearing in the pictures, you can see that they've had very, uh, several care team visits or a tube placement or um, a, a stick or a treatment. And then there are many other types of beads that are used. I'm not seeing any polymer clay beads in this slide. So we'll move to the next one. It's not just glass beads or commercial beads. There's also a large group of people out there making polymer clay beads and they are used for the sibling program arts and medicine, and as member beads. Now let's get to those glass beads. Acts of Courage beads. Acts of Courage beads are made by glass artists and are given to acknowledge the courage displayed during treatment, defining milestones. This year, we expect to need approximately 100,000 of these handmade beads. They need to be donated so children can continue to receive a one-of-a-kind bead to honor the courage displayed during a significant treatment. These beads are truly bringing art to the arts and medicine program. So I'd like to talk a little bit about um, one of their fundraising um, projects that I really enjoy participating in. Um, This is the Carry a Bead program. 
And I think uh, Floor featured some of the beads earlier. As you can see, it's a safety pin and it has, well, it's a pin um, that has a little tag on it that talks about give hope, honor, courage to carry a bead. And they're two beads. So the kit itself costs $15. And with that $15, you are receiving two beads, a program card or an activity card, what you do is, sorry, lost myself for a minute there. Um, the kit contains a pair of matched beads to carry or wear on your adventure. So imagine that you cannot leave the hospital or your home. This program takes the children on vicarious adventures all over the world. The kit contains a pair of matched beads to carry or wear and the story card. After your activity, you write about your adventure on the story card and then return one bead along with the story card to be given to a child in the Beads of Courage program. You get to keep one of the beads to symbolize your shared strength. The more times you carry a bead, the greater the strength. I really like this program. And you can see it means a great deal to the children. Look at these guys. They are so happy to share their one carry bead that they received and the card telling them where that bead was carried. So this is just a great way that you can also help Beads of Courage. All right, what, beads, what does Beads of Courage mean to me? As Floor mentioned, I somehow was inducted into the Beads of Courage Hall of Fame, which was also a great honor. Um, to be able to give comfort and help children tell their stories through beads that I make and donate is so mean meaningful. To know that a bead I have poured love, hope, and strength into will be held by a child who is going through so much to help them in their brave battle with serious illness is humbling. Along with making beads, I teach others to make beads. As the saying goes, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Over the years, I have introduced bead making to thousands of students and every class is encouraged to learn about and donate beads to Beads of Courage in hope that by teaching more students, beads will find their way to the children. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions about Beads of Courage, I know Floor and Peter are going to have some links and resources. So uh, I'm going to do that. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think you were not the only one um, who got emotional during that because it's um, it's a pretty big deal. It's a big deal to um, to the kids, to the people who make them, to their families, to their siblings. Uh, I remember in Tucson itself during the Tucson Gem shows, um, Beads of Courage puts on an event. And um, I was asked because I was there to um, uh, accept the uh, Hall of Fame award for two of my friends. So I was there with the award. And then this kid comes up to us, thought I was the one making the beads. I felt very guilty because um, I haven't been making beads. So I haven't been making beads for Beads of Courage. But I could tell from their gratitude how much it meant to them um, to have this. So um, people are very... Um, very appreciative of what you do um, and the beautiful beads you make and the story you told. Uh, we have a question by Ziva who said if they also take store-bought beads as a donation. That is a very good question because of the size and standards of beads. Um, normally they don't unless possibly they are um, like a glass bead that has the correct size hole. And on the Beads of Courage website, 
they have all of the information what size, what size the hole needs to be, and what kind of beads they're looking for. Yeah, and so um, um, so they do, in general, they don't take the store-bought beads. They would prefer, um, if, if you were able to give a financial donation, you can do that through the PayPal link that we sent, but you can also, of course, do that directly um, to Beads of Courage. Um, but don't worry, we won't be keeping any of the money that goes, uh, that will all be going to Beads of Courage. So um, Michelle has mentioned that uh, her daughter works in uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, her daughter, um, where some of the um, uh, kids have those beads as well. So, uh, and they do travel uh, all over the world. It's a wonderful program. Um, and beautiful beads that um, uh, those necklaces and that beads that you showed were pretty impressive uh, uh, as well. I need to see more of those in person. Um, <laughs> I think at the moment we don't have any more questions uh, for Sam. So um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. So I'm going, there you go. Um, it's back on me. Um, so we have one more question on um, which hospitals participate. The list of the hospitals that participate is on the Beads of Courage uh, website. But I also know sometimes when hospitals, especially international hospitals that don't participate, there's sometimes a possibility of a guest program that goes directly through the parents and not through the hospital. So that is an option as well. So we've come to the end of the formal presentations. Um, so we now get to look at your beads, which I will be sharing with you, um, which is fun um, because they are, it's, it's very different um, from what you've been seeing. And it's also different some, in part from, there's beads in there I know nothing about, um, but I'll share um, whatever I can uh, and what I know with you. So some of you may have seen on the Facebook beads of, be of uh, the Beads Symposium that I posted these. I could call them a teaser uh, for people to share their beads. These are beads that are special to me, and I'll, um, I'll let you know why they are special to me. Uh, and that's because um, I found them. I found them in the ground, in the little garden of a place that I stayed in the Czech Republic. Um, I was going to the Czech Republic to do my very first research on beads and bead history. So I found this little apartment on top of a hill in Jevolonets, Czech Republic, um, to study the beads that are made there in abundance. And I found that the whole um, garden was scattered with these beads. And it felt like I immediately landed in the right place. So they're kind of magical to me. They like this, they are discarded beads because it turns out that the family who lived in the house um, up until the 1980s, they were bead stringers. So they would get a bunch of beads from the nearby bead factory and they would be stringing them. And all the beads that were not perfect, you can see some of these have wonky holes or they're just not quite right. And they would just toss in the yard. So all these flowers and greens growing in um, on, on the soil of beads. So that is my special bead story. And we're gonna be going to the next bead story. Let's see if we got that right, yep. So I think this is the oldest bead that we have um, in the bunch. It is by um, Danny Lopaki, and he'll share with you a little bit about this bead and how he got it himself. Uh, there we okay. Go. I bought this bead from David Ebbinghaus many years ago. He said the only reason he sold it to me was because he thought I liked it more than he did. Anywho, you can see on the text that I put in the video, exactly what it is and its size. Definitely one of my all time favorite agent beads I've ever had. So it was a quick look, but a very impressive bead um, with all that beauty. The, the way it's made is just exquisite, especially if you consider the type of tools they had. So this is like a whirlwind. We're going from one to, um, well, to the next. This one is by Stephanie. Um, and I know she's watching us right now. And she wrote something about 
uh, about this beach that I'll share with you. The symbol of the disc with a cross showing a circle in each quarter is known as the Cross of Constantine. When his armies prepared to attack Byzantium from the east, Constantine had a vision of this cross in the sky, took it as an omen, converted to Christianity and succeeded. It became Constantinople. Discs of glass with a central hole like this were used in Roman times as a button component to fasten cloaks and garments. Almost all the other beads on this necklace are ancient, but are a whimsical mixture for recent tourists and include delicate Egyptian faience tubular beads and very small faience ring faience ring shapes with a few glass oblate shaped beads. I learned that the decorated glass disc with central hall was a type of garment button as worn in Byzantine times and there it must have been a mysterious found object that had been incorporated into tourist jewelry in the mid 20th century. Um, together with an assortment of delicate turquoise faience jewelry mummy beads with dark glass oblates, small discs and shell slices with some drawn embroidery beads, just a few tiny cornelians and the coral bead, bead all linked in brass or silver wire. The disc itself mounted in a similar handmade metal setting. I also show the reverse of the pendant with its dangles. The symbolic value of such a small treasure for me is a reminder of all the way that all faiths, signs and visions within their epochs seem to fulfill a need that humanity has always had for some sense of purpose and mission and reaches much deeper than accumulated information and both good and bad, these symbols appear and change form throughout history. So thank you, Stephanie, for sending us that one. Next is a video by Sage, Sage Holland, a bead maker. Arkansas sends our love to the bead symposium. Okay, well, these are um, some of my life, tree of life beads, connection to the sky and the earth and all things in between. A hand bead, protection, strength, greetings, welcoming, creativity, four directions. Uh, everything to do with fours, four seasons and four directions, four emotions, four elements, and wheel beads or disc beads, I'm staying centered and balanced um, and keeping a good moral compass while on the move. And eye beads, protection, um, keeping an eye on you and Staying awake and willing to see all that you can see out there. These are unity through diversity necklaces, and each bead is made one at a time, of course. And they're made to be different, but go together well and cooperate in a whole unit. And so that's all I have for today. Thanks for this time. So thank you, Sage, for sharing that with us. And then we have these beads by Michelle, who she sent in. And she said, I'm attaching a photo of the beads that are on earrings that probably belong to my grandmother. Since I'm in my 50s and my mother was, was born in the 40s, I can't say for sure how old these beads are, but they are really interesting and beautiful to me. Everything on these earrings is original. I've not replaced the ear wires. My grandmother passed away in the early 80s and I was given her jewelry box. She was fond of and could afford costume jewellery, so most of the pieces are not precious. But these spoke to me, above all, of the rest of her jewellery. I wear them often and just love how sturdy and colourful, yet understated and unique they are. If anyone, if anyone can recognise from which era these beads came, I would love to know. So anyone who does know, um, you're welcome to put that in the chat. Um, because I'm sure Michelle, because I've seen her around, um, is watching this. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they might be Japanese beads. Think um, 1950s, maybe. But it's very difficult to tell with these glass beads. And I'm not very good at knowing jewellery findings. So that is going to be my guess. And then we have um, Linda Carol Morrison, who shared uh, these beads with us. And she wrote, I discovered the amazing 50 plus year old Magnum's 
beaded paradise in the outskirts of Blackfoot, Idaho, during the last throes of their existence. What began as Western uh, wear store supplying outfits for their square dance hall morphed into a bead shop when the Native American friends requested bead for their tassel. I emphasize friends because this was a time when the Native Americans were not even allowed to try on clothes in most stores, but this shop was Native friendly. I consider the beads I bought there good karma beads and feel they infuse that good karma in my creations. And the beads are a few of my creations to go along with it. So these are uh, creations by Linda herself, some beautiful bead embroidery. So continuing with this whirlwind, we are now heading to Ecuador. Um, so these are by Maria and Maria writes, Thank you for letting me express my passion about beads. I'm from Ecuador, and since I was a child, I've always been impressed by the beauty of the colors of the beads of the indigenous people of their daily use, and it led me to collect from the pre-Columbian -pre colonial and Republican times. Being the spondylus uh, is the most important cultural, significant uh, religions, sorry, I messed that up. Being the spondylus, that is the shell, the most important cultural, religious, and economic material before the colony of South America. For me, it is a way to find my own identity. Here, I share a Shimu Peru necklace on material that I have strung according to their own design. And a beautiful piece it is. Next is a video by Pasenuro Sherpa, um, who is showing us his Z beads and I'll share what he wrote. I have inherited them from my parents back in early 1980. I was told my by my father that these are to Lukmak, but Tibetan Lukmaks look very different. Someone told me that they could be ancient Mesopotamia. If anyone has any more info, it would be very helpful to me. The other one is an eye bead with bird's wing on the back, according to my father. All three are rare Z beads. So Z beads are a very special um, study that they require. They are stone beads with specific patterns. Um, I have not ventured into learning more about Z beads. Um, I'm sure some of the people who are uh, listening and know more about Z beads, but um, dating them is, is a class of its own. And there's several full books written on, uh, on these types of beads. And I think it's fascinating that they are now in the symposium as well. Here's a, a bead that has special meaning um, to someone where Laura Simone, who's a glass bead maker and um, a, uh, who paints on glass beads as well. Um, this is where she made a memorial bead of um, this parrot named Hollywood for a friend of hers. So that is also another way in which beads can have special meaning. The almost last bead, uh, and I have to say, when I saw this bead, um, I've never seen anything like it. It's a glass bead. It's made by James Jones and Isis. Isis Ray sent it in. She said, it's difficult to choose just one bead that has a lot of personal meaning, but I chose this glass bead by James Jones from Portland, Oregon. I met him at the Seattle Art Festival Bumba Shoot in 1992, where he was selling his beads. I'd only been making beads for seven months at that time, but he offered to trade with me. He is so kind and humble. This bead he gave me was so complex and different from anything anyone else was making. It looked like a Navajo rug and there were Marini on the end of the bead around the halls as well. He was inspired by photos of the work by Japanese master bead artist Kiyoyu Asao from, who lived from 1918 to 1984. And Jim taught himself his own unique techniques. I've collected many of Jim's bead, beads, but this was the first. For those who make beads themselves, this is technically an incredibly stunning bead. And I'm going to leave you with um, Linda, who will be sharing information on this wonderful bead and what it means to her. Hi, my name is Linda Sweeney of the Sweeney Collection. And I want to tell you why this bead is especially important to me. It's by Japanese artist named Akihiro Okama. I first saw this bead at the Trajectories exhibit at the Bead Museum in Glendale, Arizona in 2007. 
Of the over 200 beads in that exhibit, I was especially drawn to this butterfly bead. This bead is only about an inch tall. The butterfly is only a quarter of an inch in each direction. And I couldn't imagine how such detail in miniature was achievable in hot glass. I had to learn how this was done. So I took a lot of classes to learn bead making techniques. I went on to start a bead making school of my own. I have a collection that is now over 2,500 beads and I've made a lot of friends of collectors and artists along the way, including Akihiro, who unfortunately passed in a skiing accident last month. But this trajectories exhibit and this bead changed my life's path. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who has shown their beads here with us today. And thank you to Cindy, Robert and Sam for um, sharing their knowledge with us. I think what um, this presentation, the presentations have shown and your beads have shown is that um, beads can have a lot of symbolic meaning and beads actually manage to touch people's lives and change people's lives and make a difference. In the end, of course, it's not the actual bead that does that, but it's the importance behind it and the importance that we people um, give to the beads and um, give when we are sharing the beads themselves. So this was wonderful. Um, I will share with you a few links. We'll also be putting those in an email for you if you have become inspired and you want to learn more. And there, so all of these will be up there um, later in your email as well. So that's me again. Um, thank you, everyone. What we're going to do is because it's mostly been um, me talking and other people talking, um, and you may feel like, yeah, but I, I I want to talk now or just chat among my bead friends, share my ideas about important beads. Uh, so what you can do is go to the link. Um, so you, you leave here and you go to the link that um, Peter's just posted uh, in the chat, but you have also found in your email. Um, Peter and I'll be heading over there and you'll be put in a random group of people who you can talk with um, for beads. Uh, don't forget, if you still wanted to donate to Beads of Courage, we'll put that in the email when the um, uh, when recording of this video is up as well. Um, thank you everyone and either see you in a bit in uh, in the after party or we will um, talk to each other at any time soon, hopefully maybe too soon 2024. who knows? Bye.